Aloha. In your text, you will or have read about Gap, which is kind of set as a contrast to Zada. The Gap is uh, a historically very popular uh, American fashion label. Okay. And during the 1990s, the Gap did very well as a company. It kind of rode the wave and helped define the look of business casual with button-down shirts and khaki pants, which, interestingly, is uh, really an outgrowth of the Aloha business casual, Aloha wear uh, fashion trend that started in Hawaii, then went to the, the West Coast and gradually throughout the rest of the United States. So Gap with their button-down shirts and khaki pants, um, along with other fashion brands, kind of rode that wave and became some defining features there. The early 2000s were, was a bumpy period for not just the fashion industry, but also the, the general economy as a whole. There was a lot of anxiety following the dot-com bubble crash, um, the uh, 2001 terrorist attacks in the United States, and there's just uncertainty in the economy. Sales were declining, and uh, Gap CEO Drexler tried some moves to kind of try to jumpstart Gap's uh, sales revenue again. One of his most uh, well-known activities was to try to go after a younger market, right? So we we had this business market uh, of business professionals, business casual, and that market is kind of aging, and other competitive markets are coming in looking for um, trying to attack that group, and so Drexler's trying to grow into another market, which is the teenage brand. So Gap starts really pushing a heavy emphasis on the youth teen market with uh, lowrider jeans, leather pants, things like that. And um, Gap found itself in the awkward position in the fashion industry of having an ill-defined brand. So is Gap now, are they business casual? Are they teenage hip huggers? What exactly is this brand now, um, which really is, is functioning as, as what you'd expect two separate fashion labels to do? So same store sales in the middle of all of this declined for 29 months straight. Okay. The founder of uh, the Gap and who he was serving as chair of the board at the time, uh, Dan Fisher, made the, made the statement that it took us 30 years to get to a billion dollars in profits and two years to get to nothing. Yeah. So they're very frustrated. So in 2002, Drexler is replaced by Pressler uh, from Disney as the new CEO. Um, which there's an interesting story you can read about on your own time of the dynamics. Drexler did not know until basically the day that he was forced to retire from Gap that he was um, being removed from the company. As a, another side note that's not in your text currently, uh, Drexler is now over leading the charge at J. Crew, which is probably targeting more of a, a younger market as well. So, and seems to be doing adequately in his career. So, that's where Drexler is. Pressler is brought in from Disney. Pressler has no background in fashion, and um, he was leading the division in Disney over resorts and amusement parks, I believe. So, it's a very different industry, but it's, it's um, creative, and it is a kind of a consumer-oriented brand, and so they bring him in. Well, Pressler has a very different cultural outtake. He's brought in, and he looks great. He gets along well with people. He's a collaborator, a team player. And one of the things that he does is he's also very numbers-oriented. So he launches a lot of customer analysis and focus groups and market data and, and research and tries to build up an understanding of what customers want and position gap to respond to the that market data. And the other thing he does that's noteworthy here is 
he tries to move GAP's culture into a much more team-oriented, collaborative approach. Okay. Now, to see, to kind of think about how this might work, if you think about a company like Apple, and Apple really runs like a fashion company. They're, they're a technology company, but if you look at their culture, they're very design and fashion driven. And in this type of environment, you can't really design things by committee. Design doesn't work as a, we're going to let everybody come to a consensus. You have to make some creative judgments. And sometimes the designer needs to take the response from other key stakeholders and say, okay, I've received the input, now I need to make a judgment call. Okay. But that's not Pressler's management style. Pressler coming from Disney is all about, he, he's creating all of these training meetings and pamphlets and posters around the company, and it's all about teamwork and collaboration. And he's supposed to be really good at analyzing data, but once again, one of the problems in fashion is customers don't always understand what they need or what they want or what's going to work. Right? And even in kind of the technology area, you look at things like web design or software design. And sometimes you have cases where someone will design something and then the client will take your new website prototype, you, you, kind of the, the early draft version of your website, and show it to their secretary. And they'll come back to the web designer and say, my secretary didn't like the website. So it thinks the colors are wrong. Does your secretary have a degree in design, in art, in graphics? No, but that was her input. And so art, design, fashion requires kind of demands the need for an expert to make an opinion. And there's going to be conflicts, and designers by nature will push the boundaries of what's acceptable. Okay? And uh, Pressler really doesn't like to have the conflict. So the designers come in, and then the merchants say, no, the, the, these fashion trends are too, too ahead of their time. They're not going to work. And so someone's got to make a judgment call to keep both parties in balance. And Drexler, being the team player, was not quite suited for that task, apparently. And so um, Drexler, uh, Pressler cuts costs, shuts down a lot of stores, tries to keep these going, build up the company, pivoted on market analysis. Um, and he's also doing things like he's outsourcing uh, more and more to, say, uh, East Asian countries. And he, he does things in the name of optimizing supply chains, which, according to the textbook, should work, right? So we're going to take all these different brands within the Gap family, and we're going to consolidate purchasing. Does that make sense? Because then we can get better economies of scale and so forth. But a challenge here is now we've got all, you know, we're bulk buying denim, right, used for making blue jeans. But the type of denim needed by Gap is the not, not the same type of denim needed by Banana Republic. And so the designers are now being forced to work with common materials across multiple brands, and it's just not working out well. Okay, so long story short, uh, the losses continue. And GAP's agility, his agility and ability to respond to market behavior and what consumers are actually buying declines. And so in 2007, Pressler resigns. Okay. Uh, the, Mr. Fisher, the chairman of the board, has to step in and serve as interim CEO while they're looking for another CEO. The um, current CEO uh, that they found, I think later in 2007, was a man named Glenn Murphy. They brought him in from the... Um, he was overseeing retail, very strong in retail experience, but in supermarkets and in, and in books and, and drugstores and such. But he's been in there since 2007, so he's got about a seven-year tenure, and uh, Gap seems to be uh, moving up again. How much of this is related to market recovery and how much of this is related to Gap would require further analysis of both of those issues. But in your textbook, the idea is Gap, by trying to play by all of the textbook rules in the fashion industry, was not able to overcome this decline in sales and shifting nature. And it, it will give Zara the opportunity to use their fast fashion model and their approach to optimizing their supply chain to really step ahead in the fashion industry.